The Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app and streaming live on YouTube, youtube.com slash at the Team 980. Joining us now, great friend of the show, Howard Beck, longtime NBA writer, currently contributing to the Locked On Sports Network and writing for GQ through the NBA playoffs. What up, Beck? <laughs> What's happening, Craig? How are you? I'm doing great, man. Um, so it's obviously been a very, very busy NBA week here. I'm going to save the Wizards stuff, though, for a second, because with all of that's happening uh, there, I haven't had a chance to talk as much about some of the actual playoff games, the actual playoff series. And unfortunately, the through line, you know, the biggest storyline, I would say, during these playoffs is the officiating so far. And uh, I guess officiating combined with the league office decisions, the suspension of Draymond Green, not throwing Joel Embiid out last night, ultimately throwing James Harden out. And it just feels very inconsistent. What have you made of, of kind of those three series of calls and how they all relate to each other? You know, it, it, it's interesting because you know, every situation is its own thing. Every series is its own thing. Every every controversial play is its own thing. But you do want some consistency as a fan, and, and not just the fans. Of course, the teams want consistency because they want to know what, you know, they can expect, uh, what, what the consequences are or aren't for various infractions. And so when you see Draymond Green ejected uh, for a flagrant two, for the stomp on Sabonis, which was the right thing, right? Like nobody disputes. I don't think even the Warriors would dispute that ejecting him flagrant two was the right call. I, I honestly don't agree. I just thought that was like a gravity and, you know, imbalance situation. But like if they had just ejected him, I would have been like, I hate that, but fine, yeah. move on. But yeah. I, I hear the, you. The suspension was the part that, that, you know, people were more surprised about and is more controversial. But the in-game uh, assessment of a flagrant two and ejection seemed reasonable uh, I think to most people, but then I'm at the game last night with the Nets and Sixers, and within the first you know several minutes of the game, you have that situation where Nick Claxton steps over a prone Joel Embiid, who not liking the step over, kicks up at his groin area. The foot, his foot doesn't actually land where it would have done more damage, and more pain, but he he got him high on the thigh. And they review the play, they give him a flagrant one, allow him to stay in the game. I, everybody in the arena was surprised. You know, I'm obviously not just the Nets fans, but I'm sitting in the media section and we were all thinking, wow, like the MB could be gone. And it, the, the explanation afterward through the pool reporter uh, who spoke to the crew chief, Tony Brothers, the explanation was basically it was about where his foot landed. And, and because his foot didn't actually land in the most vulnerable position of Nick Claxton, um, it was only a flagrant one. Had it landed in the vulnerable position, um, to use a wonderful euphemism, uh, he would have been. <laughs> it, it would have been a flagrant two, and he would have been ejected. But it, you know, you can't you can't kick another player, and you can't kick with the aim toward that region uh, without it looking like that was what your intent was. So I, that was curious. And then, of course, in the course of that game, we have a couple more of these now. James Harden ends up uh, swinging his fist down um, to somebody else's uh, vulnerable region and gets tossed immediately. And then that one, you know, Harden said it, you know, it was, it was incidental, you know, it's always hard to read intent of these things, but that's part of, of the situation. Um, he gets ejected and then Claxton late in the game, you know, uh, flexes on Embiid, gets a second tech and he's thrown. I mean, it's just, Last night's game in particular just felt all over the map, and the inconsistency from the Draymond Green uh, flagrant two ejection to the Embiid only flagrant one, those are the things that frustrate people, frustrates fans, frustrates teams. Um, obviously, the Sixers were more than happy to, to get the reprieve, but uh, it's not a great look for the league. The more we're all talking about officiating, as we've just done for the first five minutes of, of this interview, the worse it is <laughs> The worst it is for the league, because if everyone's talking about officiating, it means that things have probably gone awry. And I will just say as a general matter, I think NBA referees do an incredible job most of the time. And the most of the controversies or a lot of the controversies and certainly all the conspiracy theories are overwrought and, and, and sometimes ridiculous. But there are times when the officiating is a real issue. And right now, this week certainly feels like it's an issue. 
I agree. And I, I don't want to spend too much more time on it. Like you said, we've already spent a lot, but I, my, my one thing that I want to say and, and kind of get your quick reaction to is I think intent has to matter more. Like Draymond's was, even if there was intent, it was a reaction. His ankle got grabbed. Uh, and he said it was the second time in the series. Um, but he's, he's kind of in a vulnerable position and reacts. Uh, Embiid is clearly trying to do damage. Harden makes that move. I think he makes that move 10, 15, 20 times a game. And often that hand lands on the other player's hip. And you could probably call an offensive foul uh, on it. But it's it's at the end of the day, him trying to make a basketball move and he, and he misses. And there's no intent there. And I, and I think that's where I get frustrated personally. I won't speak for anyone else. But it's the lack of looking at the intent. Where I, I don't want guys scared to play basketball. And I also don't want guys trying to do stuff and then not get not connecting in the right place and then getting away with it. And to me, I think that's why specifically to the Embiid Harden stuff last night, why they got those calls so backwards. Yeah, yeah, ex- exactly. You know, every, every uh, driving player is going to use their offhand to try to create some separation or keep a guy, you know, you give him the forearm just to try to hold him off of you. And, you know, there are, it's always a fine line as to whether or not that can be an offensive foul. But a lot of the time, you're just driving by a guy and you're just trying to keep him just slightly off you, creating a little space, um, giving yourself room to drive. And, yeah, like, obviously you've got to be careful about where your fish sure. is landing. Um, but, you know, I, I, think, I think Harden seemed, like, legitimately shocked that, that that was the call. And, listen, even if they decide it's more than an offensive foul, even if they decided, you know what, uh, you, 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 you actually hit him as opposed to just held him off, flagrant one would have been fine. Agreed. Um, Agreed. It, it, and, so, and so then we get into this thing where now fans and, and, and the teams are starting to think, like, is this a makeup call? You, you didn't eject Embiid, so you ejected Harden, and then now they're mad because you ejected Harden, and now you're, you're giving a second tech to Nick Claxton on, on what could have just, they could have just swallowed the whistle on that one. It really wasn't that big of a taunt. Uh, this is kind of stuff that happens every game. Um, it, it, just, it just felt like the whole night was just a, a series of inconsistencies. Yeah, no, I, I agree. All right, that's that's enough officiating talk, and probably that's the last time I'm going to talk about that series on the radio because now it's 3 nothing, and, and Phillies certainly looks to be on their way. Howard Beck is with us, contributing to GQ throughout the rest of of the playoffs, so make sure you read his work there. Uh, the other, I mean, great showing by the Warriors last night. They, uh, you know, they continue to be way different at home than they are on the road without Draymond. But I actually want to talk real quickly about the other game before we get some of the Wizards talk in at the end here, Howard. And I can't believe how close the Clippers kept that game without uh, PG, without Kawhi. What have you made of that series as Phoenix, who a lot of people thought like, okay, especially without Paul George, they're going to they're gonna run away with it. And even even though they're up to one, these have been close games. And last night was a one possession game in the final two minutes. What have you made of Phoenix so far and kind of their status as, as favorites to come out of the West despite their seeding? Missed last night's game, but uh, in general, that series, it, it's just such a, a strange one, right? These are two teams that if, if they're at full strength um, and if, it, they, if this has been the, the teams as they're presently constituted for the entire season, this might have been the one and two in the Western Conference, right? Like right. everybody thinks the Suns are, are kind of the de facto favorites because no one really believes in the Nuggets. Apologies to the Nuggets. Uh, and the Clippers, if they'd had a full season of Paul George and Kawhi Leonard and, and they've got a really nice supporting cast and a lot of depth, they play tough, they play defense, like that could have been like this is a this is a potential Western Conference Finals matchup and not a four or five in the first round, but we don't have Paul George in this series, and uh, you know the Clippers don't have Kawhi Leonard uh, on top of it for for that game, and it's been and it's been strange. And the Suns are not a cohesive unit yet. Their bench is really wonky. They don't have uh, you know any real reliable depth. Monty Williams is still experimenting with his rotation and, and trying to figure out who he can rely on. And as great as Kevin Durant and Devin Booker are, this is a, a like a brand new team. Durant played eight games with them in the regular season. And so everything feels like you, it's just, it's just hard to define or get a grasp on uh, the matchup, to be honest. And I, I, you know, from the moment the Clippers, you know, won a game in, in Phoenix and stole home court advantage, I thought this is a series that might 
you know, go the distance. And it's certainly looking that way, but we don't really know what Kawhi Leonard's health is going forward. Yeah, and that's obviously the biggest factor. Uh, as you saw, spectacular he was helping them win game one on the road. All right, uh, back to the home team. Howard Beck is with us, contributing to GQ and the Locked On Network of NBA podcasts throughout the postseason, a longtime NBA writer. Um, I presume like you've been aware of Tommy Shepard for a long time, first the Ernie Grunfeld years where he's, he works his way up to assistant GM, and then ultimately he's running the ship for the last four years did you have any inkling that this was coming? Like, I mean, we talked throughout the year, Howard, like it's not like this team was good, but Ted Leontis's history says that he's, he's loyal to people through the end of their contracts. And, and also it seemed like Tommy Shepard was just executing what Leontis wanted. How surprised were you that, that Shepard got fired? Yeah, I was surprised. And yeah, listen, like a lot of people who've been covering the NBA for a while, I've known Tommy since he was the PR director for the Denver Nuggets, uh, long ago. So, um, he's, you know, that's a really interesting position, right? So every team operates a little differently. The way the Wizards have operated under Ted Leonsis' uh, ownership is, you know, whether it was Ernie Grunfeld, uh, whether it was Tommy, who worked under, obviously, Ernie before succeeding him, there's always been an understanding that Leonsis had certain tendencies as an owner, as, as, as owners do, one of which was not going to ever rebuild, not going to do a teardown, um, doesn't want to risk an empty building you're you know that that market tends to be a little soft with the wizards as it is and the other piece is that you know a, a player like john wall or bradley beal they're going to ride with them until they can't and you know they they keep rewarding beal with max extensions and now a no trade clause um you know people can put that on on tommy shepherd in the front office that's uh, reasonable um but the ultimate you know, uh, you know, decision maker here is, is Leontis, who uh, all indications that we've all heard over the years are he does not want to part with Bradley Beal. Now, all the different junctures at which you and I even have talked about, you know, should they have traded Beal or should they do it now? And we did this probably a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. It's an <laughs> Every annual... year, Howard, since I moved to D.C. Yeah. in 2015, it feels like we've had this conversation at some point during a season. And, and it, it, it will hang over them until the day that he either – retires or uh, or finally does get traded but it's becoming harder because you know the combination of age injury history the contract everything um so yeah i mean like, i was surprised that they fired tommy when they did they, they could have done that weeks ago um that you know they, they've, they've been out you know i mean it hasn't been that long but still like you know normally you if it's going to happen it happens quickly or you get wind that it's going to happen and that it's kind of inevitable and i think the sense around the league was that they were going to stick with him because, as you know, Leonsis tends to be loyal, uh, not only to players, but front offices. Um, and, and listen, the track record is what it is. Um, they have not drafted particularly well. They've gotten, you know, good, OK players, rotation guys, but nobody that was going to change their trajectory. Uh, you know, I, I thought they did really well to, you know, first offload wall for Westbrook and then flip Westbrook for the package from the Lakers that they got. I mean, um, there's been some decent moves along the way but you, know, you can't exactly say that the track record has been spectacular and you know that's that's how it goes in this league if, if you're you know you get so many shots at, at, at getting a roster in shape and making the playoffs and eventually your time runs out yeah um the market for beal um it obviously would have been really, really strong a couple of years ago. Uh, but as you mentioned, age, injury, history, contract. What do you think it would be right now if they go, whoever the new executive is, comes in and they have that conversation with Ted and ultimately go to Bradley and say, look, man, we just we need to tear it down. We're starting over. You have the no trade. Uh, we want to send you somewhere where, where you want to be because, well, we have to because otherwise you can just say no. Uh, what, what kind of market do you think Bradley Beal will have and you know I would assume that anywhere that they you know that would want him he'd probably want to go because it's going to be more of a contender who's looking to add that final piece but what do you think that market is not great um I, I don't I don't know you know I've, I've engaged that recently like asked anybody like hey would you know <laughs> is I first of all the first question is is he even a, a a net plus asset if you're trading him or are you having to attach other things because teams are having to take on his contract? I mean, I understand, you know, Bradley Beal has been an all-star three times in this league. He's a guy who's going to get you, you know, 
20 to, to maybe 30 points a game. You know, he, he's, he hit that 30 mark a couple of times in his career. Um, great shooter. Uh, you know, obviously evolved as a, as a ball handler and playmaker over the course of his career. He's a really good player. Like, he's the guy who years ago, you and I probably talked about it, I always wanted to see them trade him to Philly uh, to pair him with Embiid long before, obviously, they got Harden. Um, and there was a time when I, I, I would say that, like, that, like that's still the allure of that is, is still strong. But you look at the contract, which is, you know, a max deal. You look at his injury history. He's not that old. Like, he's only 29, but, like, 50 games this year, 40 games the prior year, 60 games the year before that, which was, uh, you know, a 72-game season. But still, like, he he did play 82 in back-to-back years once upon a time in, in 2018 and 19, but it, it's been a while, and he's he's just hurt so often. The contract is huge. I don't know if you're actually trading him for value at this stage. I, I don't know what you're getting for him. I, I just think it's a really tough tough one to do. It's it feels that way, and yet every summer there's these trades where you go, wait, you got stuff for him? So maybe maybe for once the Wizards can be on the receiving end of one of those. Um, that certainly would have been the case, or I guess not that specific one, but they would have gotten a lot for Kyle Kuzma at the trade deadline potentially. They now stare down either re-signing him to who knows what of a team or letting him potentially walk for nothing, or I guess they could get lucky and he wants to go somewhere that doesn't have space and they have to sign and trade. If you're the new executive coming into Washington, what do you do with Kuzma? Do you let him walk for nothing and just say it's a sunk cost, or do you try to re-sign him? I don't let him walk for nothing. I try to, you know, it's, it's, it, this is going to sound like the obvious thing. The first thing is you try to sign him to to whatever a reasonable contract feels like, because even if you don't think he's a long-term piece and you're trying to ultimately move toward a teardown, you don't want to lose a really good player for nothing, an asset for nothing. Sure. Sign him to a deal that you can later trade him on um, as long as it's not too bloated that that might scare teams off. Uh, it, short of that, yeah, look, I mean, there are plenty of teams that would love to have Kyle Kuzma. Most teams are going to be over the salary cap this summer. The teams that have cap room are in various states of rebuild. Does Kuzma want to go to Detroit? I mean, you know, maybe um, yeah. Orlando. Uh, a couple other teams with cap room. I mean, how, how far is somebody going to be willing to go? Or is there a team out there that is over the cap, that is, is closer to contention, that you know could make a deal uh, to acquire him in a sign and trade? I, I think you, you do everything possible not to let him walk for nothing. But I don't know if there's – I don't know how big of a, of, a, of a threat that is given that there aren't that many teams with cap room and they may not be places he wants to go. Yeah, that's true. Um, Detroit's interesting because he's from Michigan. Uh, other than that, I don't yes. have a, I don't have a whole lot for you on anywhere uh, of the other places that you said. The Magic also seem to be good uh, potentially with young players, so that's that's must be nice. Win thirty five games and actually be on the upward trajectory. What's what's that like? Perhaps the Wizards will know soon. Howard Beck, uh, you you probably gonna not find a lot of Wizards coverage in GQ uh, this time of year, but you will find <laughs> great coverage of the NBA playoffs there from Howard, all playoffs long, also contributing to the Locked On Podcast Network. Howard, always great to chat, man. Appreciate it as always, and uh, probably talk again before the playoffs are done. Always a pleasure, Craig. Thank you. This is the Hoffman Show on the T nine eighty and the Odyssey app.